Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Today I will. This will be the concluding lecture on Polani. Then we will do a little bit more <coughs> of uh, actually the standard stuff: supply, demand, uh, micro, macro, general equilibrium. Very quickly. So we start by. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. So this is uh, the dua for speaking in front of Fir'aun. This the Musa عليه السلام was taught this dua. Open my heart and make my speech good, and make this task easy. So, um, they said this is the du'a for oral examination, because <laughs> it's like standing in front of Fir'aun. <laughs> So the main thesis of uh, Polani is that the industrial revolution was the <coughs> beginning of a extreme revolution. Basically, it brought a new religion to the world. This new religion is completely materialistic, and the basic belief is that all our problems can be solved by material means. Now, <coughs> the analysis of Polanyi is 180 degrees opposed to nearly everything that is currently taught in social sciences, in especially in economics. So, one of the ideas of economics is that the economics can be studied in isolation from the politics and from the society. And Polanyi says no that all three structures have to be studied at the same time. And basically, modern market societies and economies emerged in 19th century England first, and since then they have taken over the world. In order to understand how this happened, you have to study all three of the processes. The social change, the economic structures, and the political structures—they all move together. <coughs> Another assumption of economic theory that you are taught is that economics is a universal invariant. Economics is the same in Pakistan and same in England and same in USA. The same mathematical equations apply. Again, this is not true. History and geography and culture, everything plays a part. <coughs> so, another important idea of Polanyi is that history is driven by ideas about history. Also, ideas about history come from the experience, the analysis of experience. So, these two are mixed together, and you can't separate them. Again, this is very different from standard. Which says that basically the material circumstances of our lives determine what will happen. So this is actually very important because it means that our uh, path to the future is not constrained by the material uh, circumstances. It is constrained by our ideas, and if we change our ideas, we can change our past and we can change our future. Now. The thing is that ideas by themselves are powerless. Ideas the start, but in order to implement the idea, you have to translate it through an institution. So you have to create institutions. Uh, the institution that was most powerful in the Islamic societies was the Waqf. That was the main in economic institution of the e uh, Islamic society, as opposed to the bank, which is the main Islamic institution of the. Western society. 
The waqf is based on the idea of giving things away. And that was the central concept at the heart of an Islamic society was generosity and cooperation, helping each other. And so the central institution which translated this abstract idea into a reality was the waqf. If there is no waqf, then the idea is just a idea. It doesn't get translated. If I, if I go and uh, I'm generous and I see somebody who's poor and I give him money, that will not change the society. That will create one act. But if I create an institution, then the waqf, and that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ told a person who came to him and he said that I have a lot of money. What should I do with it? So he could have said that, okay, go and spend it all on the poor. But he didn't do that. Because he said that buy a property and make it a waqf so that the earnings from that property are spent on the poor and this will take place in perpetuity forever. So that your reward will last forever. So this is intelligent spending of resources. Just like when we have money and we want to invest in dunya, then we look for the highest return. So when we want to invest in akhirah, you look for the highest return. So this is the first waqf. The idea of the waqf was introduced in the time of the Prophet. And in the du during the Islamic civilization, one third of the lands in the Ottoman Empire were waqf. And before the coming of the British, there were many waqf in India. And all of the education of all of the children was financed by these waqf and uh, all of the health needs. Basically, the idea <coughs> which uh, was the standard traditional idea that if anybody is sick, it is the job of the others, the healthy, to take care of him. It is not his job to drag himself to the hospital and to find the money to uh, purchase medical service for himself. So this idea uh, created institutions which translate this idea into practice and it was done for thousand years nobody in uh, had, had knew what the word tuition fees means <coughs> this concept did not exist in fact the reverse concept was true those with ilm had the responsibility to give that ilm to others so there are many cases where alim is walking and somebody comes and asks him a question and despite all his uh, business he has to answer because it is now a religious compulsion that somebody seeking knowledge then you have to provide. So this is the <coughs> idea. Then there were institutions made like the madrasa which is still existing. Anybody can go. There is no tuition fees. Coming back to Polani. So these are the ideas of Polani as I am saying. Uh, the idea that uh, the ideas are powerful but they are not powerful by themselves. They have to be translated into institutions. Uh, both of these are not known to economists or to even social scientists that these are things. In fact, social scientists don't think that ideas matter in general. The political, they think that the material structures are the things which determine societies. Um, so, the basic analysis of Polanyi is a disequilibrium analysis. He says we start in some equilibrium state and then some change happens and then he says what this change will do. So we start out instead of, you know, variance starts out by saying optimization and equilibrium. It starts out by saying, no, let's study the process of social change. Social change is continuously happening today. And so actually what we have studied is only the 19th century. So we have a lot of work to do to catch up and unfortunately uh, we will not be able to do that but uh, one of the books that I strongly recommend that you read is uh, Naomi Klein uh, Disaster Capitalism no hmm. I've forgotten the name right now but I'll remember so <coughs> What he says is that the key factor which led to the invention of capitalism 
was the invention of large machines inside a commercial society. That is also true that the mercantilism has had created for the first time a society in which markets were an important part, but they were not still a central part. This was intercity trade. Mostly it was a self-sufficient economy and mostly traditional economy with concepts of paternalism, taking care of the poor and all of the traditional society concepts. But with the invention of the large machine in a commercial society, uh, some changes were had to happen to accommodate the production of large-scale uh, goods and some of these changes were that the uh, supply of labor and land which were inputs into the production process had to be put on the market. Actually, yani, it's important to understand that this is only in a commercial society. If there are other ways to organize large-scale production, like Russia did, it uh, organized large-scale production without commercial, like Japan did, and uh, like we could in an Islamic society, do it in different way. Uh, but in that society, that was the natural path, and they took that path, and this created social change. So the invention of the machine led to uh, the commodification of labor and land, and the creation of money, because money was not so important. But when you do large-scale trading, then money becomes very important. And especially if money is used to buy food, etc., then it becomes very important. In self-sufficient societies, the necessities are outside the reach of the market. So market is a peripheral thing. You buy, use it to buy luxuries. But if you don't have money, you still get fed. And the same thing is true in our rural societies, or at least used to be, that people don't have any money, but they can live because they're... But when money became very important, then it also, to make the system work, it was necessary to have, to elevate greed, which is not a natural ingredient uh, of uh, natural motivation of human beings. Uh, it had to be made important because uh, if people don't, are not motivated by money, then one day the laborer will show up and one day he will not. They say, okay, today I la feel like relaxing. So, it was necessary to <coughs> make this greed a very supreme motivating factor so that the system would work. So, everybody has this idea in their minds that the object of life is making money and this is much more important than your family, than your uh, friends, than your relatives. And so, we see the effects of this way of thinking all over the world. Now, um, so one of the things, again, I want to emphasize the contrast between this and the conventional thinking. So economics takes for granted that everybody is greedy. Here we are analyzing the fact that actually greed is not neither uh, socially acceptable nor a natural ingredient, but societies can make... Um, can induce social change, so they can change the norms. So this is exactly what the Quran says, that people are born on the fitra, they have generosity, compassion. Uh, in fact, studies show, recently they have started studying, that babies' hearts are full of uh, compassion. If you smile at a baby, the baby becomes happy. If the people in the room are sad, the, this will affect the baby. Also, uh, they have seen babies are in, uh, inherently helpful. They, an experiment says one uh, adult is writing and he drops the pen and the baby crawls and picks up the pen and hands, up, hands it to the... So, the desire to help others is built into the hearts of the people. So, to make greed, you have to do a lot of training. And I have seen how, um, I mean, in American families, children are trained, the um, little baby brother, you can, I saw this on the video, was trying to, uh, trying to 
he was told to do the dishes and the older brother wanted to help he said no it's his turn you must let him do it and he is being paid for this so basically and and this is exam uh, uh, this was presented as an example of good parenting so um from childhood people are trained that you are all alone you can't help others you can't expect help from others that like that the famous joke about the child whom the jewish child who the father says that jump from the uh roof and i will catch you and then when he jumps uh father moves away and the child hurts and he says okay this is your lesson don't trust anybody <laughs> <coughs> Now um so nearly everything i am saying are things which are systematically rejected and denied by classical economic theory so one of the things that polani says is that history is a uh, process in which basically it's uh, history is made by groups of people acting together it's not an individual process it's not a process of one person doing anything because history is uh, this sort of almost by definition although so you, uh, an individual can influence history by creating a group by creating people who are who have a common vision and goal and identity a group is not just a collection of people but it is a collection of people who think together as a team these are the these are the things which can change history so marx analyzed history as a process of class struggle there are laborers and there are capitalists and their interests are opposed but uh, polani says that the social change process creates and destroys classes and also um in the class struggle who succeeds and who loses doesn't necessarily depend on the power of the or the strength of the class it depends on other factors including the social change process if it's moving in a certain direction then uh classes which are aligned with the process will succeed and classes which are trying to work against the historical change will typically fail so in the mercantile economy there were merchants and there were agriculturists as the change process occurred of uh, the big machines the merchants naturally became the industrialists and that led and the peasants became laborers and so that led to a labor class and a capitalist class uh also the power of the landlords was reduced so the landlords had imposed these corn laws which kept basically made sure that the corn prices are uh high so that they would be able to sell their corn and basically the removal of the corn laws was a major uh, uh, uh point at which the basically the merchant classes or the industrialists power exceeded that of the landlords and basically then the power of the landed aristocracy in england became less and the power of the merchant classes and the industrialists became higher now in 20th centuries we have entirely different classes the industrialists are marginalized they are not so important anymore the financiers are the strongest classes and the corporations as the multinationals are are the much more powerful than nations at this time so actually if you want to study today's economists you have to study what the corporations are not what the nations are and what what they are doing uh the nations are being run i mean the usa is a puppet it doesn't it doesn't have any independent um will anymore everything that is happens in the us is um driven by financial interests of a small minority not of the majority and the majority is being seriously damaged by current usa power majority of us domestic population is being seriously damaged by policies but they are powerless to change things there is a appearance of democracy but actually the power lies entirely within a very small 
concentrated class of people who have the money. So class struggle is there, but uh, there are deeper underlying factors. Yes, the book is Naomi Klein, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. It's a very readable book, very uh, easy to read. And uh, I have often written that that book gave me more knowledge about economics than a PhD, four-year uh, four PhD program, because so it's very worth reading. So basically, takes the story which uh, Polanyi tells up till World War II. So it starts from there, uh, actually starts in the 70s and brings it up to date until about 2000 or so. Now, <coughs> one very important concept which Polanyi introduces is that although there is class struggle, no class by itself has enough power to enforce its will upon the others. So, the consequence is that the classes invent ideologies which have the appearance of, which have the possibility to create consensus. So, they say that, you know, we should work for increasing our GNP per capita and uh, yes, the wealth will accumulate in the hands of the masses, but it will trickle down. So this idea is something which, at least on the surface, you can sell to others. So uh, the class which is most successful is the one which can get the greatest buy-in from others. So if you propagate an ideology which says that okay you are free you have and if you accept this you will be able to live like the Hollywood movie stars it's a very uh, useful propaganda tool even though it's it's a lie that's the problem that even though the ideology itself so it's always a always a uh, something that is being sold to the pub public but the packaging is different from the inner reality and so this is the nature of the world we live in so um, Polanyi says that the classes which created the world the market economy were the, was the trading classes they had the they were aligned with the process of history and also he says that they did not know what was going to happen that the exploitation of laborers the destruction of family life the destruction of communities and neighborhoods spoiling forests pollution of rivers uh, general degradation of existence uh, the middle classes were only looking after profit and they developed a sacramental belief, a sacred belief that okay if we pursue profits this will be solve all our problems automatically and they could not foresee and nobody could foresee the trajectory except for a few very far-sighted people so because the middle class pursued the profits so uh, this was one interest that was uh, that was uh, followed by them but there were many other interests of society which they could not protect so other classes came in to guard those interests so if you want to study the 19th and 20th century society there is one society which is carrying the market interest and the profit interest and the other other classes are trying to defend themselves from the bad effects of this and so you have to study this double movement which to understand what is happening because at any point 
you can say if I say that this is the thesis that the market society was emerging, you can find a counter example that no laws were being passed against it and so on. So that's why because of this mixture you can find example of anything that you like but so you have to understand that it is a continuous battle between one force and the other force and sometimes one wins and sometimes the other wins. <coughs> so <coughs> um, the liberal classes developed this ideology that the free markets are supremely efficient and they do everything well and if we just let less affairs Let's, let's let everything be on its own, things will automatically turn out for the best, there should be no regulation, government should not interfere and so on. He said that this was, this became uh, a powerful faith only because um, the huge amount of uh, suffering that had to be inflicted in order to make this happen. So in order to do the extremely cruel things that needed to be done, you had to have very strong faith in the uh, correctness of your ideology, otherwise you would see with your eyes that there are children working in the factories who are and um, <coughs> laborers' lives are being destroyed. So you would say that there is something wrong with the system or and then you would try to change the system, then you would not be able to carry out the needs that were So now the strange thing is that <coughs> uh, markets cannot function on their own. So there is an inherent contradiction between market society which says that there should be no government and the fact that markets are unable to uh, self-regulate. Uh, if you let the money supply be uh, driven by free market processes for example, it will uh, create the Great Depression and the global financial crisis and so on. So price stability is required and how does that happen? Well, it's because the government regulates the price of money. So for example, everywhere in the world, including Pakistan, I'm on the Monetary Policy Committee and what we do is we try to make sure that the supply of money is uh, in such a way that inflation is not caused and uh, prices remain stable. That's one of the main goals of uh, monetary policy all over the world. So this cannot be done by the free market, it has to be done by the government. Similarly, there are many other things where basically although the mar free market ideology says that just leave everything alone and government is always harmful, free markets cannot exist without uh, a strong and efficient government. So, um, one of the, the basically it's ideas which drive history and ideas can be wrong or right but people believe in them strongly and because of this belief um, they act according to that belief. So one of the beliefs that was created that how can we have stable prices was that it's necessary to use gold. And on this belief there was a widespread agreement across the spectrum between the left and the right. So everybody agreed on the need for a gold standard until the early part of the 20th century and so this has another whole story which I will not be able to tell you I had planned to originally but there is not enough time so the story of what money is how it has functioned how it created crises how it was regulated what uh, are the major illusions in the minds of people who run <coughs> monetary policy today about the nature of money. Uh, all of these things are very important to understand and uh, 
इसको नहीं हटा सकते ये स्क्रीन टच स्क्रीन नहीं है मेरे ख्याल में मगर यहाँ से शायद ट्रैक हो जाए नहीं चलो कोई बात नहीं सो दे वर दीज आइडियालॉजीज एट द बैक ऑफ आई हैव अ बुक व्हिच इज कॉल्ड इकोनॉमिक्स एज रिलीजन एंड दिस इज रियली द ट्रूथ इकोनॉमिक्स इज अ रिलीजन इट इज अ सेट ऑफ बिलीफ व्हिच इज नॉट सपोर्टेड बाय एम्पिरिकल एविडेंस uh but it is strongly believed anyway and uh so if you attack it then people get angry so that's why my students have to be very careful because uh <coughs> i am teaching them heresy against the dominant religion of the world so if you say something which offends you then you can become like mashal khan <coughs> so you have to be very careful in concealing your uh, true beliefs and saying only those things which people can accept and also the quran says that start by um looking for the common ground those things which everybody can agree on so this belief in gold as money was a very powerful belief it has driven history it still has adherents although they are very few and left and the idea of money and how it functions is a very crucial driver of economy and there is a huge amount of misconceptions about this which have been spread by those people who control the money because they don't want the world to know how money is created and how it is used and so the most important illusion about money is that money is a veil so that don't think about money basically economics is a process of putting blinders blindfolds on the eyes of people and there are so many blindfolds that it is hard to count them <clears throat> but one of the blindfolds is the idea that money is a veil it puts the veil over your eyes and prevents you from seeing the uh, role that money the important role that money plays even though you know this is very strange that everybody who has yani just thinks by his own self without being fooled by economics books will immediately see that of course money is very important <laughs> yani every day we deal with money we understand how important money is then to say that money doesn't matter how can you believe this <coughs> this is strange but so this shows that how what a powerful religion it is that it makes people believe in things which are so absolutely incredible that any sensible person would reject right away yet this becomes the firm committed belief and now if you say that no money is not neutral that people will start disputing and arguing with you that no of course it's we have proven it as a theorem <coughs> so international free trade was also an article of faith again it has very strange and sort of impossible implications that okay you should let some foreign nation produce food for you and you should produce industry and uh, what if the ships sink or what if uh, a war breaks out etc then we will die of hunger but no the efficiency demands that uh if you have a comparative advantage in wine then you should produce wine and the other party should produce the so it's a it's a very um uh stupid theory <coughs> furthermore the theory doesn't even work the comparative advantage theory even on its own grounds it is wrong but uh, basically it's it's an article of faith <coughs> so there are three major principles of uh free market economies one is that you should have competitive labor markets uh this is to make sure that the supply of labor is freely available to the industry <coughs> one is that there is a gold standard which makes the money stable technically and then there should be free trade <coughs> this is necessary so that the huge amount of surplus that you produce which is useless for anybody can be uh, sent to other places and you can show many examples of how consumption chains were created that people who were living peacefully and 
they were uh, like in India we were given the habit of drinking tea so that they could sell tea from China and get money from the Indians to pay the Chinese for some of their products so basically a double uh, creation of needs uh, and basically involving people into the market society now you can't do without tea so if you're going to drink tea then you have to also provide labor to the <coughs> capitalists so that you can earn money so that you can buy tea <coughs> so as I was saying earlier one of the very important things that you must understand is how theories are sold so that they have one appearance and they have another reality this is exactly the truth so <coughs> there was this uh, Persian philosopher Mazdak <coughs> and he had uh, invented a religion which became very popular in Iran and his religion said that uh, there is no private property all property belongs to everybody so it seems like a very great philosophy that the rich people are enjoying life because they have they have all uh, captured all of the things as private property so uh, it seems like it's a very appealing philosophy to the poor but the results of this philosophy were exactly the opposite of what it suggests what happened was that the powerful and the rich people went and occupied the property of the poor people <laughs> and the poor people could do nothing and it happened that they would go into the houses of the poor and say everything belongs and nobody and it, 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 they didn't say that everything belongs to us <laughs> they said that uh, there is no private property so this is not yours we can use it too and of course the poor people didn't go into the houses of the rich because they had the guards and the <coughs> so <coughs> exactly 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 like this Friedman has sold the theory of uh, free markets by there's a famous book by Friedman and Rose called free to choose which is sort of the Bible of the free market and it paints a picture of a society in which everyone has freedom to do whatever they want and is the ideal society and the this society is uh, <coughs> corrupted by the government which has laws and rules and regulations which prevent people from doing what they want to do so the best thing to do is to have the smallest possible government which makes little rules and so on and so forth now the reality of this is exactly the opposite when you have a freedom then the poor man who has nothing the only freedom he has is to sell his labor to the capitalist to get uh, and the f uh, capitalist does not get regulated by the government so that he has to pay a minimum wage which is enough for his needs he shouldn't he does not need to provide a good environment so that uh, the laborer has uh, some security some some um, safety on the job so <coughs> basically the free to choose is the freedom for the wealthy to buy the whatever they want and the freedom of the poor to sell themselves <coughs> to survive <coughs> but the picture is such so strong that people believe in it so Karl Marx also recognized this he said that capitalism does not only require that laborers should be enslaved but that they should be happy in their enslavement that they should believe that this is necessary for the functioning of society <coughs> so this is the remarkable accomplishment of these theories <coughs> so there is the story of the lady and the tiger it was this poor laborer who was working in the courts with his friend and somehow or there that he managed to meet the princess and fall in love with her <coughs> so the king found out about this 
and because he loved his daughter he didn't want to kill him right off but she said okay uh, he put him to a trial which was traditional in that society so he put um, two ca uh, two uh, doors in front of him one of them had a hungry tiger and the other one had one of the maids of the princess and so if he chose the tiger he would die and if he chose the other then he would be married to the maid either way he would be <coughs> disposed of as a threat so the man is standing in front of the two cages and he is trying to decide which one to choose and the princess is watching from the stands it's a big and she signals him to choose that door now he knows that the princess is a very jealous <laughs> woman so he doesn't know whether he should uh, she values his life more or whether she <laughs> uh, is willing to throw him to the tiger rather than to see him married meanwhile his best friend <coughs> is also standing in the stand and he also signals to the door <coughs> now his best friend is a lifelong friend but he knows that the best friend loves the other maid <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so he doesn't know which to draw, uh, which person to trust so the fact is that what the story is saying is that all of the news that we receive about the world is by interested parties there are no disinterested parties so there is no way to for us to get to the truth <laughs> in and there is no easy way to get to the truth so <clears throat> basically the way this capitalist system works is by selling dreams if the reality was known there would be a revolution immediately because even now you know the bottom 90% is so yani they their lives in the USA have become very bad over the past 30 years until the 70s uh keynesian policies were held and the keynesian policy supported the labor force enough so that they grow <coughs> prosperous but ever since the reagan thatcher revolution life has been getting worse and worse for the american uh a bottom class and if they could see through you know the in the rome that there was an elite upper class and the poor, the people rest of the people were hungry so when there was a lot of uh, discontent then they would have these games where they would have gladiators and and so that would make the people that would entertain the people and keep them from revolting so today we have hollywood it is the seller of dreams and it sells the dream to the people that you too can be one of the upper elite class and and by imagining themselves in that those positions they can live with the actual reality which in which they have no chance of actually ever doing that so <clears throat> in the olden times the religion was the opium of the people in the sense that it uh, according to the marxist theory and the christianity which was actually one of the reasons that christianity was rejected in the west is because those people who were most compassionate most uh, interested in changing the lives of the poor poor they saw the religion as an enemy because they said that the religion prevents the revolution from happening because it makes people contented with their lot that okay you enjoy this life and we will enjoy the other life and so they they don't react against zulm and uh, so they are an obstacle in the path of the revolution that is needed to bring about the change that we want so this is a point that i've already made that basically and and this is a uh, also made uh, forcefully by Naomi Klein that there is never any situation where the free market will come into existence by itself it has to be enforced because uh, free market is so damaging that basically it cons the the one clear cut effect of free markets which you can see everywhere it has operated is that it creates a concentration of wealth in the hands of the very rich um 
government regulation and uh, other things prevent this and allow the people to exist uh, so uh, you can th see throughout uh, history and throughout uh, that uh, the people who are the most uh, free market oriented like in the USA in the global financial crisis the free marketeers when the bl banks collapsed they ran to the government and said bail us out and this happens routinely the, it is yani the system is so bad and so unstable that without the government coming in it cannot be run on its own but the exactly the opposite myth is propagated by the free market theorists so basically this is yani polani says that the world war 2 saw the collapse of the gold standard the collapse of international free trade and it led to uh three um different um responses in germany there was fascism that basically yani uh once the free market collapses then you have to invent an alternative method so fascism was one that the strong state uh, socialism was another which is saying that okay you uh, give from those who have the ability to produce to those who are needy and in usa the same capitalism but with the uh, uh provision for the poor so basically in all cases the situation is that the free market leads to uh, misery for the poor and if the misery is strong enough then this will lead to revolution so somehow or the other you have to find a solution you have to find a humane solution this is the battle from the beginning as we have discussed last lecture that the capitalism system works on the misery of the poor and so some and, and basically not only just the misery of the poor but the normalization of this that uh, the making the hearts cold and making us uh, uh ignore and and uh, lack sympathy and and fee basically deadening our hearts to the pain of others this is the only way it can work and the important thing to understand about this is that when your heart is unable to feel the pain of the other person then it becomes um like stone so it cannot give you happiness you cannot feel happiness for yourself so basically uh it makes it impossible for you to be happy even in even when you have infinite amounts of luxury so this is something which do, which is not understood by the capitalist who sell the idea that wealth is the only route to happiness so as opposed to um so what mm, polani is arguing is that the idea of planning emerged as a response to the damages done by free markets and this is exactly the opposite of the story which is told by traditional economics textbooks that planning led to damage and free markets were the way to uh uh evolved from uh the bad results of planning it's exactly the opposite that the disaster caused by free markets led to the idea of planning so the some of the key ideas of the liberal free market creed are true we, we cannot fight them so you have to understand that where is the weakness and where is the, because people who are uh, leftists often fight the capitalists on the wrong grounds where the uh, free market is are right if we provide unemployment benefits there will be less Uh, labor there is no doubt uh, somebody asked me uh, that suppose we provide universal benefits which is currently what will happen well you can answer that question think about suppose we provided a living wage to all what will happen at pied how many people will continue working and how many people will stop working and think about what will happen throughout so uh, there is no doubt that um, there will be a disincentive and so um 
if, if you have private businesses and uh, uh, government enters into business, they will, their interests will be damaged. There is no doubt about that. If we do deficit financing, the government uh, that make that can cause inflation. That if we are paternalistic, if we take care of our people, then people will have less initiative. I mean, if you throw a person in the shark tank, he will start uh, scrambling. And if he is uh, safe, he will not scramble that hard. So all of these things are true. So these are not the grounds on which we can um, attack the free market. They, they have their own points. So there are other... So you, this is very important to understand, especially for my students, that uh, you cannot, uh, that they, they, there is an area of strength and you cannot attack on the area of strength. You have to understand the areas of weakness. Okay, this is a passage which describes uh, the emergence and rise of various classes. I'm not going to go through this, but this is a mode of analysis. Uh, which is valid for the 19th century. Now we have to replicate this uh, and nobody has done this for what is happening today. There are different classes which are um, bearers of different types of interests and the current society is molded by uh, for in Pakistan for example there is the traditional landlords and there are the industrialists and there are the governments and there is the anglicized classes who have uh, basically uh, become um, uh, have their Mecca in uh, London and New York and uh, there are different classes and they have different interests and uh, they are working in different directions how we can create harmony in these classes this is the problem that faces us <coughs> So I've already discussed this point that we need to appeal across classes if we want to win. So the secular uh, people don't uh, put forth the idea that religion is bad directly. Rather they say that certain secondary uh, ideologies are uh, challenged. And similarly, yani every class wants to appeal to a broader base and so all of the platforms that are put forth are uh, necessarily compromises so uh, that you can appeal to a larger group so that you can get the power that is needed to carry out the programs. So now we turn to uh, the conclusions the social goals that we choose are culturally determined. These are not, we are not robots. The goal is not, it's not that every human being is driven by greed and consumption, but actually the society determines our goals and it is up to us to choose what goals our society will follow so um, uh, there has been just like in England in the industrial revolution a class of people which was working in their lands peacefully and earning their living they were converted into the poor and this whole class was created which had no means of support and then they were transformed into laborers because their natural social structures had been destroyed exactly the same catastrophe has happened in our society ours was a society which was functioning just like uh, what has happened in Iraq today uh, it was a very it was actually a very successful society uh, it was one of the most modern and advanced societies in in um, the Middle Eastern countries and it had a very high standard of living and then there was carpet bombing and it was destroyed and now the people are uh, the richest people are uh, beggars and same thing happened in Libya it was one of the most advanced societies in in um, Africa it, uh, and Muammar Khadafi had taken it from the bottom to the top by 
a brilliant set of programs but it was carpet bombed and the society is now no longer functional so now they are available as so uh, we can see this in many situations where um, uh, functioning societies have been destroyed and converted into raw materials to feed into the capitalist machine so but the most powerful weapons are not the wars but the voluntary participation as i have said there, there is a a dream that is being sold that you can also become an america and you can also become wealth and rich even what is america is not uh, is is what is seen in hollywood movies the reality of america is not known to most people so um today the today the process that took place in europe a long time ago uh, we are in the middle of this process and the forces that are aligned us against us are very strong these forces destroy individual lives by converting a human being into a, a factory unit uh they destroy families they destroy communities uh they destroy all um genuine feeling in the heart by replacing it by uh, artificial uh substitutes like the um the social media creates an illusion of friendship and uh social interaction which every human needs but this is not real <coughs> and uh today the people are so accustomed to the artificial that they forget what is real so um when i was in um bill kent university um uh, bruce hamilton was the head of the department of economics in um, johns hopkins and he came to visit for one semester so when he came i asked him that how did you manage to come he said it was with great difficulty because i couldn't persuade my family because the imagery is that uh outside america there is only the jungle and people live in trees and so uh i told them that yes this would be a broadening experience so he had two daughters and so with great difficulty i persuaded them that come for one semester and we we'll, and it's not that bad i have visited his life is comfortable so after the end of the semester they were going back and so i asked him so how was the experience he said that both of my daughters are crying and they um don't want to go back and uh, so i was very surprised i said what what happened why what did they like about turkey so he said that they went to the school here and they found friends like they have never made in their life so today um we have a society but tomorrow <laughs> yani when i went to america um you go to the coffee shop with your friend and um, he pays his quarter and you pay your quarter and if you offer to pay for him then he is little bit concerned that if i take this favor then i will have to return this favor and there is something uh maybe he wants something from me so this transactional society this market society <coughs> as opposed to this um social uh that we are together and whoever can afford it is and uh this kind of difference is created in the market society where every transaction counts so you keep track at uh, end of christmas you calculate that okay this one gave me a gift of 200 dollars and you write it down in your book and this one gave me a gift of 20 dollars so next year you know what is the level of the gift that you have to buy because you have to keep the market so the islamic revolution was created by 
changing the motivation of individuals. The society that came, it came into was the Jahiliya and it was just like modern society. The people were fighting each other for small things and it was all selfish and <coughs> so uh, Islam created new social goals. What will we strive for? It created a social transformation. Uh, it changed the purpose of life. So today we are faced with the same problems that existed in that period of time. So some of the key changes that, and there are so many that it's impossible to cover, but some of the very important Islamic concepts that are essential to understand in order to create this change. Uh, one of them is the uh, the change of thinking from outcomes to processes. That instead of working to achieve a goal, uh, basically you can say it's not about winning or losing, it's about how you play the game. So success does not lie in getting a degree or any other worldly goal, having a career, having a family, things like that. These are not, success lies in this moment. In this moment, if I can understand what is needed of me and I fulfill it, then I am successful. Now, how do I understand? So there is a linkage that is required. What is required for of me at this moment? So, um, Uh, there is the idea in a recent lecture at PPF and in many other places the idea arises that first we should study the world and acquire knowledge and then we should take action based on this knowledge but the opposite idea is uh, propagated by Islam that you, as you struggle to achieve a goal, in the process of the struggle, you will be given the knowledge that is required to uh, complete the task. So, this is again a reversal that uh, what, what we do, what is often done is that you do a lot of research as a basis for action. So, uh, there are lots of studies which are done about the nature of poverty in Pakistan. If you took that same money and invested it in actually fighting poverty, perhaps uh, things would be very different. But uh, instead you have multi-million dollar conferences in luxury hotels and uh, to fight poverty. So um, the third very uh, difference, a very big difference is that Whereas, uh, you see, uh, the, the, the we do action in the world in order to create spiritual progress. The opposite concept is widely believed by sincere Muslims that, uh, you see, we give charity to help the poor. Uh, no, you give charity to obey the order of Allah to reduce the love of money in your heart. So it is for tazkiya. So the uh, side effect is that poverty will be re relieved, but the main effect is that the problem is the is the is the love of money which has been spread throughout the world. And if that love of money is reduced, so so we do we take action in the world for our own internal, personal, spiritual progress. So this is again a re reversal of what is normally thought that, okay, religion came because it teaches you to take care of the poor. Actually, we take care of the poor and, and this is explicit in the Quran. The Quran says that, You will not reach the goodness until you spend of that which you love. Now, the suppose I am going to give something to someone else, then uh, there is, if there is something I love, I give it 
uh, that may not be the best for him. So what uh, uh, the ideal thing would be for me to do would be to choose something which is best for him, the one to whom I am giving. But that will be best for him, but not be best for me because if I give the thing that I love, that will put the greatest uh, hit on my heart and that will be the best thing for my own spiritual progress. So Allah Ta'ala is telling us to do give away the thing that I love because that is what will uh, that will have the most effect on my own heart for tazkiyah. And so that is the purpose and there are many other evidences for this. So how can we do this? Again, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest example in all dimensions and he carried out this change and his he started all alone and he created a team and they changed the world for a thousand years. So the message is very powerful. All of the information required is there but it is not uh, something that you can get by uh, participating in Quran study groups. You have to uh, bring it into action. You have to change your lives in order to create change. So. Some of the keys are to learn excellence in conduct, which the Prophet ﷺ said that the excellence in conduct is if somebody does harm to you, you return it by doing a favor to him. But if you cannot reach that level, then if you does harm to you, you forgive him. But if you cannot reach even that level, then you can take revenge, but do only as much harm as was done to you. So this is the very pragmatic nature of Islam that all people cannot reach to the highest level of excellence at all times. So nonetheless the goal should be cleared for us that this is where we want to go but if you cannot reach the highest level then try for the second level. If you can't reach the second level then you try for the third level. Unfortunately most of us if somebody does a little bit of harm to us we want to do ten times the damage <laughs> so, so as to get any satisfaction. So this is uh, this is actually the reality of what is uh, Muslim behavior today. So excellence in conduct. This is actually the heart of Deen, and unfortunately, it's forgotten. Uh, any, um, there are so many different ahadis which show that. Okay, so the one hadith about a woman who used to uh, fast every day and. Uh, do tahajjud all night and some uh, it was reported to him though she is such a pious person so the prophet sallallahu said that who takes care of her chores the household jobs so he said there were her neighbors realizing that she is such a pious person they do it for her so she so he said that they are superior to her because by uh, performing the service they get all the reward for the worship and they also get the additional reward for the um, service which is even higher. So in, in many cases, in many many places the Prophet ﷺ, there was a camp and he went out and he started to collect the wood. So the other people said, no, no, you, should, you are our leader and beloved and you should rest and let us do the work. He said, no, I am also in need of the reward for the service. So doing service to others is worth more than 10 years of itikaf sitting alone in the masjid and um, worshipping in concentration. So there are so many things that basically Islam is not about sitting in a cave and worshipping Allah. It is about doing service to man. It's about feeding the poor out of the love of Allah. So this is two things. That feeding the poor can be for the wrong reasons. The first uh, person to be thrown into Jahannam will be the one who had fed a lot of the poor because he wanted to get fame or if you want to get uh, a gratitude that okay I'll help all of these people and all of these people will be my slaves they will do my bidding because I have I have uh, made it life possible for them so the Quran says that we give to others we don't even expect or want your thanks we don't want you to say thank you to us on the other hand so um, uh, this is one thing. The other thing is to learn to trust in Allah. So excellence of conduct is, 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 uh, is primary. It takes precedence over ibadat and worship. But unfortunately Muslims think that today that the one who stays uh, in the uh, masjid all day 
is the one who is the good Muslim and uh, the more nafil you make and the more hajj and the more umrah that is the sign of Islam and not that don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, have sympathy for your neighbors, serve the poor. So Islam unlike Christianity which did not, which, which told the poor to be satisfied and that's also true that if you are oppressed then uh, Islam teaches you to bear it with patience, have sabr. But for those, so, so opposite lessons have been taught. If I do you a favor, I am not supposed to expect any thanks. But you are told that you must thank the person who does you a favor. So it's a combination of paradoxes. If you don't feel gratitude towards one who has done you a favor, how will you feel gratitude to Allah? So uh, it is a combination of paradoxes. So um, uh, learning to trust in Allah. So our deen is very sophisticated, far more then uh, it can be understood by uh, uh, very simple ideas that people have. So, one of the keys to deen is trust. Allah Ta'ala says that those who adopt taqwa, they will be fed from places where they cannot calculate. So, Trusting means that having no apparent causes of safety and believing that Allah Ta'ala will save me even though there is no, no cause in sight. So that is for example when Musa alayhi salam has the army of Firan behind him and the river in front of him and there is no apparent means of safety and the Qawm itself is saying that Oh Musa, you have destroyed us, sea of God. And in the books, we were told that a prophet would come and he would lead us to victory, but you have gotten us all killed. So he says, no, don't worry. Uh, Allah is with me and he will find a way. So this is the quality of trust. So after that, Allah Ta'ala split the river. But the trust is... the that is the miracle, uh, but the miracle is the property of Allah. Allah Ta'ala can do whatever He wants. But the lesson from the story is the, the trust that Musa salam showed in Allah in very adverse circumstances. And Allah Ta'ala said exactly this, that He will create a pathway from where you cannot imagine uh, where Allah Ta'ala will save you. But this requires trust, those who have taqwa. فَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ اللَّهُ حَسْبُهُ and if you don't trust Allah, then you will not. Then you will be left to your own devices. So the third thing is that Allah Taala wants hundred um, percent devotion. It says yudhulu fi silme kafa. This fifty-fifty that um, okay, I will do my five times prayers, but the rest of the life is for me. <laughs> so I will I will pay my fine to Allah, but uh, the rest of my life. I will do according to how I please. So you make a bargain that, okay, I give you 10% or 20%. So this is not acceptable. Allah Ta'ala says that I want all your heart and mind and soul, everything. You have to give it everything you have got and then you will see. So there are many difficult paradoxes which are, basically you see life is not about getting wealth and you can see this easily this is a deception of the shaitan if you go and just talk to the people who are the richest you will see that they have nothing that an ordinary person and that's what said in the hadith that the person who has food to eat for that day he has health he has uh, comfort and safety he has everything that the richest king has I mean this is all that the world has to offer us some food, some people have a lot of pleasure in food, but there's only a finite amount that you can eat. Uh, comfort, security, um, health, these are the greatest treasures. And when we have them, then uh, we have everything that anybody has. And so we should make shukr for that. And then we should find out what life is about instead of missing 
missing out so we have to combine uh, uh, islam is full of paradoxes we have to do two opposite things at the same time we have to be afraid of allah and we have to love allah uh, umar رضي الله تعالى عنه said that on the day of qiyamah if it is announced that only one person is going to jannah and everybody else is going to jahannam then i will have hope in my heart that i will be that person and on the other hand if it is announced that all the people are going to jannah and only one person is going to jahannam then i will be afraid that maybe it is me so having this range so in studies we have to have humility we have to understand that i know nothing allah taala has all the knowledge at the same time we have to have confidence in allah taala that he will guide us and uh, he will give us the knowledge that we need to do the work that we need to do so self confidence combined with complete humility again these are opposites and you have to combine long term planning with living for the moment that on the one hand there's only this moment i don't know whether i will live uh, uh, one more moment and at the same time you have to have long term planning because um, see a journey of a thousand miles began with one step so <clears throat> if you have a big goal in front of you that i'm going to change the world and you take only one step so towards that goal then your action will be rewarded like the one who has achieved the goal so it is said that if person decides that he is going to memorize the whole quran he is going to become a hafiz and he doesn't even know how to read and write so he starts the qaida and starts reading alif ba and death takes him then he will be raised up among the huffaz because he had made the intention and he had taken the step so this is how you combine long term planning with short term it is said in hadith that if you are planting a plant uh, you are put planting a seed on the day of judgment and qiyamah comes now the plant will not have any chance to grow continue finish your planting why because your planting is based on your niya for and and this will earn you the reward it's not based on the outcome of the process that goals are always in the hand when you go into jihad it's not because you win or lose it's because you're fulfilling the order of allah it doesn't matter what the outcome is and so all of our life is a struggle and it is a struggle for us to realize our inner potential every single individual here has the potential to change the world without any doubt so what is the way forward well we are in a desperate war for survival the enemy has taken all the battlefields they have invaded our personal lives our homes our families in the tv today we watch people which uh, we could not imagine any rapists and murderers and thieves and and even worse we are made to admire these people the movies uh, feature a person whose uh, the whole uh, job is that he is going to do the great train robbery or he is going to and uh, uh, there is a prostitute who is made the he- heroine and she is a very nice and kind and warm and loving person and so on so uh, we are uh, given these illusions which destroy the reality it's the truth actually today the boys get to see these women who are more beautiful than huris on the screens they don't really exist but now uh, when they get married they are unsatisfied with their life wives uh, that they are not uh, comparable to the standards that they have seen so and and they are uh, given these movies which which present an illusion about what a perfect life is and they are unhappy with the reality they have which is much better than the uh, the illusion that they have seen so uh the our enemy is an ideology it's a dream actually there's a hadith which says that on the uh, towards qiyamah the dajjal will come and he will have his jannat and he will have a jahannam but his jannat will really be and whoever believes in him he will put in his jannah so today it's actually like that 
the apparent Jannah which everybody is trying to get into is really Jahannam and the inside of the reality of the pursuit of pleasure you know it looks like very attractive that let's let me do everything I have all this religion is just a barrier to my pursuit of luxury uh, it doesn't allow me to do things that would make me happy so but if you do them you find that like the heroin addict he takes this and it gives him a temporary uh, uh, boost and makes him temporarily very happy but then he becomes habituated and then he starts selling his uh, and, and he becomes a desperate addict and his, his life is destroyed so basically the what looks like appealing and has short term appeal it has death and destruction inside uh, they are, they are Islam which seems like a very boring and forbidding religion which has lot of hardship and harshness and uh, you can't do what you want and you have to get up in the morning and use cold water to do wazoo it's, it's very unappealing looks like Jahannam on the outside but inside is very sweet so the um, ideology of greed and cutthroat competition as the way to organize our society is on the ground operational we have a ministry of competitiveness and we have uh, people who are uh, teaching this in our graduate schools even in uh, it was yesterday who was it that was telling us the story about how ah yes I remember now so um, this Wharton graduate uh, I won't name him since he asked to keep it conf confidential they had uh, two people um, uh, as they graduated one was uh, Donald Trump and the other one was uh, Milliken and they both did any extremely harmful things Milliken did uh, uh, created funds and uh, inflated prices and, and did a lot of cheating and eventually he was jailed and Trump also did uh, engineered bankruptcy while having millions and millions of dollars he declared himself legally bankrupt and managed to uh, basically that meant that lots of people who owed uh, whom he owed money he could just walk away from so basically he uh, avoided his responsibilities so <clears throat> on the basis of that the some of the business schools got together and said look we are producing these people who are completely socially irresponsible we should try to do something and they created courses in corporate social responsibility etc these are not having much effect but the idea that I'm trying to say is that this uh, ideology of greed and cutthroat competition the harm that is causing is being realized in the heartland but they are really not unable they're not really able to do something about it so the burden of responsibility lies upon us to create an alternative model we have the possibility to do so uh, at this time we cannot we don't have enough number to take on the enemy which is the ideology in a head-to-head -head battle not enough people so you can only do guerrilla wa warfare which means you chip away at the corners you look at um, um, where you can do a little bit and you do your little bit and basically that is how major changes happen and you can find many many examples that there is no I mean people think that there has to be a leader and uh, he has to guide change but actually in many phenomena change happens by a lot of people doing a little bit instead of one person doing a lot so actually when a lot of people start participating and now actually the falsehood of the lies that are being spread has become apparent I mean uh, so it's not difficult to take on the challenge so but you have to do it carefully for example if you're somebody says that free markets are good then you should not say that free markets are bad you have to use the uh, empirical evidence which they don't have you have to say that look what has happened 
uh, to the American society as a result of free markets. You have massive inequality. What about the global financial crisis that was caused by uh, greed and of the Wall Street? And you can name what about the situation of the world where uh, wealth is concentrated in hands of uh, 13 people, half of the world's wealth. So you have to use data and empirics and you have to keep cool because the uh, um, this is a religion that we are fighting so you cannot uh, be passionate uh, you have to be so you have to start with easy targets work on your own self that is our own first target this is the this is the job that actually the poison of uh, materialism individualism selfishness has penetrated all the hearts no exceptions so we have to first yani um, cleanse our own hearts this is the tazkiya that is required then we can work on close friends and relatives and similar minds don't work on uh, difficult cases that will discourage and dishearten you work on the easy cases So I think we are at the end of time and so um, I would like to end this lecture today.